Manchester City have dropped points once again in the Premier League, once again, this time to Crystal Palace. But why? In today's video, what I'm going to be doing is attempting to tactically analyse the match with some helpful data and my trusty tactics board, focusing on the offensive and defensive deficiencies that City had with a focus on the lack of a right-sided presence and also the lack of good dual winners in the middle. Of course, Walker was individually at fault for both Palace goals, but there's a bit more to it than that, and it's not as simple as just take Walker out of the team and City win every single game from now until the end of the season. There are clear issues at City. This is how City set up, 3-1-6, Pep going back to this. No Grealish able to start, according to Guardiola. Nuno started out on the left, a bit disappointed with that. I'll get into why in a moment. Let's start, shall we, with the offensive issues that City encountered against Palace, because the defensive issues are a little bit more obvious, and it's the same issues that City have had for the entirety of the season, essentially since Rodri's injury. This is a passing network from the match for Manchester City. Now, immediately, you should be able to identify that Savio is isolated. There is basically nothing going on. It is a wasteland from a Savio perspective. Now, I don't think Savio was particularly good in the game, but was that because he was bad individually, or is there a little bit more to it than that? Has Savio forgotten how to dribble, or more likely, is there a bigger issue at play? For whatever reason, City focused the majority of their attack down the left-hand side. The right side was hardly utilised, and that is madness from my perspective when you've got Savio on the pitch at right wing. Didn't quite understand that, and when you've got Nunes out on the left wing, as we will discuss. This was probably my favourite attack of the entire game, and it started from the right side. In just nine seconds, City go from here to a situation where Haaland should probably be scoring a goal despite Palace's settled defensive shape. Why was he able to do that? Because of Savio's gravity. Gehi is dragged over. Of course, Mitchell is trying to deal with Savio, but Gehi's dragged over. And if Gehi's dragged over, that means the entire Palace back five is now stretched. So gaps are now emerging where Palace would not want those gaps to be. That's obviously going to give a bit more space to Man City's players. So now De Bruyne's got a little bit more space than he normally would have done because again, Gehi's out here. So uh, LaCroix, I think this is, has to come out over to his left more so than he would want to. De Bruyne's now got that space found by Bernardo first time into Holland, and maybe, maybe he should be doing better with that chance. But the reality is that these chances were few and far between for Holland. So I'm not going to be too critical of Holland's finishing in the game. The issue for me was more this emphasis on the left, lack therein on the right. The right-hand side was heavily underutilized. It was our lowest in respect of the number of attacks. And of course, it was the lowest in respect of our expected goals as well. Compare that to the left-hand side and it is night and day in that respect. And I just haven't quite been able to figure out why because we did a similar thing to this last season as well. The difference was, even though I didn't agree with it last season, I could sort of understand why, because you had Doku there as a 1v1 threat. Whilst Nunes has been playing well at left wing for City this season, he is not that sort of player, so it just didn't make sense to me why you would want to have Nunes in those 1v1 situations. Why would you try to force that situation? This is one example of many throughout the entire game. So Doku's actually on the pitch right now. He went over to the right in Savio's play. So many of City players out on that right-hand side, overloading to isolate. You've got Kevin De Bruyne, Bernardo Silva, Doku, etc. all over on that right-hand side. Walker hits the switch, finds Nunes. And this, on paper, in theory, as a concept, is a really nice position for City to be in. Now City's left winger can just run at Palace's right wing back 1v1. Lovely situation. But this isn't Doku, this isn't Savio, this is Nunes. And again, Nunes had a good game against Palace, but in this very specific instance, it just seems bizarre to me to want to force those situations. These are Manchester City's dribbles from the game. Again, Nunes, really good in terms of his dribbling output, but he's not a Doku, he's not a Savio. None of these dribbles really led to that much. Let's take a look at Savio now. Only attempted two dribbles in the entire game. Now, has Savio just forgotten how to dribble? Because if we look at the last five matches, he's getting close to eight in terms of attempted dribbles. Now, has Savio just forgotten how to attempt dribbles? Probably not. Or is it just how City were set up? Clearly, it is the latter. This is a graph from City's first half dribbles. Nunes out on that left-hand side. Savio's one successful dribble 
isn't even out on his right wing, is in the centre. There's that one unsuccessful dribble there. And I would love to show you Savio's second half dribbles, but I can't because he did not attempt any. Now, I don't think that's a Savio issue. I think that is a setup issue. Savio was consistently getting doubled up, and that's fine. If we're solely using him as a decoy to drag other players over to him, then that's fine. We've then got to utilize that fact. And outside of that chance in the first half that I showed you earlier, there weren't that many instances where City were exploiting that point. So I just thought that was a really weird situation by Pep. I didn't quite understand it. From a lineup perspective, I think you could have easily solved this and unlocked Savio a little bit more in the same way that Bernardo Silva was unlocked against Nottingham Forest. He had a really good game there out on the right wing when he struggled out on the right wing for the majority of the season. Why did he have a good game? Well, because Kevin De Bruyne is just that guy. So I don't know why he couldn't have just swapped around De Bruyne and Bernardo. You don't have to do it for the entirety of the game, but just sometimes rotate a little bit more. I think it happened maybe, in terms of a sustained period, it happened maybe twice where De Bruyne went out to the right of the diamond and Bernardo went to the tip. Outside of that, it was very stagnant and very clear that it was Bernardo out on the right, De Bruyne at the tip. Now, you might go, but... Nobbins, as you just showed earlier, De Bruyne being at the tip helped create that really good chance earlier. And yes, I'm not saying that he should always be out on the right of that diamond, but just rotate a little bit more. And that's actually how the second goal was scored. Because look at this diamond now, Gundogan at the base, Bernardo at the tip, Lewis left, Kevin De Bruyne right. So it's not like City can't do anything unless De Bruyne is at the tip. In fact, I think that City in general probably play better with De Bruyne positioned in those slightly deeper areas outside of the opponent's block rather than within it. I think that now given De Bruyne's age, it probably helps him out from a physicality perspective. De Bruyne finds Bernardo here. Bernardo finds Lewis. He scores the goal. And shout out to Nunes because his positioning here gives Lewis all of that space. Again, if Nunes was being used purely as a decoy or mainly as a decoy in the game, I could understand the Nunes at left wing situation. But that's simply not what City were doing. They were not using Nunes as a decoy. They were using him as the main attacking offensive outlet. And I just didn't understand the logic there. Let's now talk about everyone's favourite topic when it comes to Manchester City. Dual winning. Hooray! We know the issues at City. We know that City are terrible physically in the midfield in particular. And we know that if you do not have someone like a Grealish or a Nunes or a Rodri in that midfield, then City will suffer as a consequence. Now, Pep confirmed Grealish was not available to start, which is such a shame because he played so well against Forest in that central area. I really hoped we would see it against Palace. We were denied that. But this is not the answer. This is not the solution to have the out of possession midfielders be Bernardo and Gundogan. We know by now this will never work. We are beyond the point where Nunes' first touch and on-ball work being suspect is an issue. His physicality simply at this stage overrides any of those other issues. And in my view, Nunes simply must start in the centre. If you want to play Savio out on the left and Bernardo out on the right, that's absolutely fine. You can even put Nunes closer to Hall and if you're worried about him losing the ball deeper, I would personally just ditch the 3-1-6 for now and do some sort of double pivot with Nunes and Gundogan and then figure out with the rest of the team. But we're not doing that. So as a consequence, what happened? What we all knew was going to happen from a dual winning perspective. We were terrible in terms of loose ball duels. We were terrible in terms of defensive duels also. But have a look at the duels from our midfielders in particular, because this is where the issues lie. Rico Lewis, 0 out of 2. Bernardo Silva, 1 out of 3. Gundogan, 0 out of 1. Nunes out on the right, one out of two. Decent. It gets worse when we go to defensive duels, though. Again, looking at our more midfield-oriented players. Lewis, two out of six. Bernardo Silva, one out of two. Gundogan, one out of three. Nunes, seven out of nine. That's lovely. It's a shame that he's playing out on the left wing where that's largely irrelevant. Wouldn't it be nice to have that capability out in the middle? Now, maybe he will be a bit of a liability on the ball. Maybe his first touch won't be good enough. Partner him with someone whose first touch is good enough, whether that's Gundogan, Kovacic, that sort of player. And yeah, there will be issues, but there are issues right now. So why not try to resolve that situation? And there's so many examples in so many examples in terms of City being terrible in terms of midfield solidity and dual winning. 
This is a bad ball by Gavardiol into Gundogan in fairness. But Gundogan tries to be Rodri here. He tries to shield the ball. He tries to outmuscle Hughes. By the way, I thought Hughes was the best player on the pitch. He was my man of the match. Just destroyed, bullied, dominated at City's midfield. But Gundogan loses out. Hughes wins it. And now Palace are away. Gundogan and Lewis make a bit of a mess here. And within a few seconds, Lewis gets out muscled and he ends up on the floor. That happened a couple of times again, leading to Ruben Diaz having to block shots over and over and over again. I dread to think what the score would have been, but for Ruben Diaz's fantastic blocking and interceptions. At least he's doing his part in terms of trying to make a solid at the back. But there's only so much your defence can do if your midfield is comprised of players like Lewis, Gundogan, Bernardo Silva. It's not a case of it being their fault. It's not a case of bringing them down and saying they played poorly. It's just the physical reality of the situation and it's not ideal. And it doesn't help when those players, in addition to being physically frail, are just making bizarre individual passing errors as well under zero pressure. Bernardo Silva here. There is no pressure here. Walker is telling him, calm down. We've got time. There is no need to lose the ball here. There is no world Man City lose the ball here. And yet, Man City lose the ball here. Bernardo Silva, it's a terrible ball. De Bruyne's got zero chance, well intercepted by Hughes. But there is no world in which we should lose the ball there. And from that point, that leads to the corner where Palace score their second goal. Again, Walker should do better on the corner. Walker, in my view, should do better in terms of not playing everyone onside in terms of the first goal. But City's issues this season go beyond an individual or even a couple of individuals. Yes, some of these issues are personnel based, but to put all of City's issues down to solely the personnel is just ignoring the wider factors from a tactical perspective going on at City this season, in my opinion, whether that's offensively, but mainly, clearly this season, hopefully we can all agree, City's biggest issues this season are defensive in nature. That was the video. Really hope you enjoyed it. If you want an even bigger deep dive into the issues plaguing Man City this season, I did a video called Are Man City Broken? Give that a watch next. Thank you to all my supporters and members, and I'll catch you guys next time.